Hi, it's Gadget UK here again, back for part two of the Atari Falcon uh, repair. We didn't really uh, have anything major to do in the last video. I was really pleasantly surprised. I mean, not only just blown away with how amazing this uh, was as a donation, it's such a wonderful machine, but also there was very little to do to it, really. So I want to try and get the CT60E in there next. We need a power supply in order to uh, power this. So I went on eBay and found a power supply that will plug into that. But you can see, just watch this, look, <laughs> there's an adapter on the end. So now I am left wondering, is the polarity going to be correct on this? It's pretty beefy, it's 12 volts, 10 amp. So yeah, this can provide an incredible amount of power. I think that's probably what's needed though. So the question is, where is ground and where does the 12 volts go? If we carefully look at the board here, I think what I'm going to do is just disconnect the mini power supply here. There we go. So you can see it only goes on one way because there's a the little edge there and then there's the clip. I think what we'll do here is just use a little bit of common sense. We know the rails, power rails on here are primarily positive ones. So if we measure from the negative side of these caps, we can work out where they're going to on here. And in fact, now I think about it, once this is on here, we can measure the ground even easier. If I just uh, put this down somewhere, yeah, that's the ground. Ground, ground, ground. We've got four grounds, is that right? Yeah, you can see them here, we've got four blacks. So what that tells us is the outer on here is the ground, yeah? The centre pin is the main 12 volt supply to this little mini ATX power supply here. You know, this is a little module that replaces an ATX power supply. You normally, you know, just like stick an ATX power connector on here. But instead we've got this little, it's like a D, it's got DC to DCs on there. You can see a lot of components on the underside of it there to provide all the voltages that uh, an ATX power supply would provide. So the next thing we need to do is pull the power supply out. We've got the connector off. Let's get that out there. Now, rather than just stick it in and go for broke, I'd like to do this in two phases. I'm going to connect the power supply on its own and measure its voltage. Yeah, the LED is on. Put it on uh, volts DC. And if we measure from the outer, the inner wants to be positive, I think. And you can see there, look, it is 12 and a half volts. It will be 12 volts, but remember, it provides 10 amps. So, you know, there's no load on it. Uh, so that just shows us that the outer is definitely correct there. Let me just double check that the center pin here isn't ground. I'm not just making a mistake here and this is, you know, miraculously uh, or accidentally a ground. Let's, let's just check that because you never know. Well, look at that. Hang on. Yeah, I'm glad I checked that because I think, I think it is the ground, the center pin actually. Or is it? No, it's not. Yeah, I'm just balancing on the centre pin there. It's got like a little line in the top of it. But from the outer, I'm guessing... Oh, it's so hard to do this. Hang on. Yeah, the outer's ground. So, let's connect the power supply up. The LED is illuminated here. If I switch it, do you see it go brighter? So it's actually on. Now, nothing's getting warm here. I've been very careful. Let's just measure from one of the grounds there to that bottom pin. That should be plus 12. Look, it is 12 and a half. I don't know if you can see that. Hang on, I'm going to be careful not to short anything here. See that? 12 and a half. And if we measure the top pin there, that should be 5. And it is 5 volts. Nothing is getting hot. That's just slightly lukewarm, barely anything above ambient. So our voltages are okay. The power supply is okay. I'll just uh, switch it off, disconnect it from here. I'll stick some tape around there to make sure that that does not come off and get mixed around at some point. So the next step, just moving the keyboard out of the way, we need to remove that jumper that I added earlier to enable onboard processor. And just carefully feed the LEDs and the switches and things out of the back there, like that, and the power connector. This is how it's shipped to me. Uh, and then we need to very carefully now align these two things. So we've got this connector down here, and I'm going to start with that. There you go, that's on. That's in the right place. And then the power connector here should just fit, there we go, into position. Make sure the whole thing 
is down and on. I think that's it because we've we've dealt with the jumper down here. The clock thing is okay, you know, we had a, a, that issue at the start, but I think it should work with its default clock settings and things there. As far as I understand, this is kind of a wireless, you can make it wired, but it's a wireless mod. Um, and when I say wireless, I don't mean like Wi-Fi. <laughs> I mean like there are no wires involved. Oh my God, it works. I can't believe it. Yeah, look at this. You got this is all different here. SD RAM two five six meg detected. It says up there CT sixty uh, six point six zero megahertz. So yeah, this is booting. This is totally different though. It's got it's got like a proprietary uh, ROM on board there that I think you can flash. Now it's testing TT RAM. Not quite sure what the difference between TT RAM is. And the normal RAM is TT RAM 32 bit. I presume it is. Yeah, so that completed okay. Let's see what happens now. Choice of system TOS Magic Linux. Uh, I'm not sure if I was supposed to press something there. It says errors, press the key. Starting gem. Exception processing. The legal instruction. Uh, so I am not sure what's happened there. It's like it can't boot up. But clearly it can do the initial part of the boot. So I'm a bit stuck with that. So I'm going to try and uh, take this off I think. I'm going to try and freeze it. I don't know if this is any freezer spray left here. Yeah, it's not coming out look. I hate these freezer spray cans. When you don't use them for like six months they stop working. So my freezer spray is not playing ball. Let's uh, do the opposite thing now. Let's try heat instead of uh, you know warm instead of cold. So I've got the hot air. I'm just set it to 100 degrees. That's like boiling point. I'm just going to wait for it to cool down. I'm watching the gauge because it kind of goes past it overshoots. It goes like 150, 140, 130. It's gone down to 100 degrees now. So let's just heat the underside of here. Remember, we're just at boiling point here. You know, you could, in theory, put it on your hand like that. It's not too much hotter than a hot air uh, dryer. You know, the sort of thing you would dry your hair with. And we'll just heat just under where the sticker is here. So you can just about see there. Can you see that? It's just lifting up here. So I just want to get a fingernail under there, like that. Don't let it slip back down. Uh, and then we'll just try and use the blunt side of the knife here. Just to try and get under like that. Many to heat this more now. Because what I don't want to do is damage all the plastic around this. So let's heat it. See if we can peel it off with a bit of heat. In theory, you could always just touch up the little bits of grey that are worn off with some uh, grey paint there. Maybe paint over those letters, certainly the R, because the R should be red, not orange as it looks here. Is that going to come off? It's getting blooming hot. Yeah, you can see, look, it's lifting here, look. Ow, 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 ow. I'm doing it this way to try and avoid bending it in the middle, because these get bent and rippled and everything. Because if you get it off in one piece, you could always, uh, I don't know, stick it on something else, or just uh, keep it in case you ever want to stick it back down again. So you can see the glue separating on the back there. There we go. So I'm not even going to clean off that little bit of sticky residue there because it's just going to assist with uh, this replacement, isn't it? I mean, the replacement's got this nice 3M sticky back in here, but anyway, let's peel it off, get it around the right way. Let's just eye this up first of all, see how it's going to fit 
in there and it might be an idea to start on the bottom oh good god that's sticky there we go wow that looks great obviously I need to just wipe over that to get the smears and stuff off it from uh, my fingers I'm going to go with this heat sink and I'm going to try and screw a fan on top of it. You can see it's got these blooming attachments here. Uh, actually, thinking about this, I could just pull these off. They're just plastic. I was going to cut it off, but I don't see any point in that actually. If we just uh, clip these through here, like this, if I can, it's easier said than done. There we go, that's one. It's an old GPU heatsink, this off a uh, old graphics card that got whizzed at some point. So I've tested this fan, it works fine, it's plugged into the connector down there, just plugs on, which is nice. Uh, and it's just big enough to fit on here, and it blows downwards, and it's silent because it's not got the enclosure around it. Now you could argue, because it's not got an enclosure around it, it's designed like this to be mounted this way, look that it's perhaps not as efficient as one with an enclosure because you get you know air trapped you get more uh, airflow with one of those but this should be okay it's got really nice uh, blades on it uh, and it'll just about fit quite nicely in the center of that look so the only thing I need to do as I say is just find some screws and try and secure at least two of those three screws I think we might be able to do all three if I get it just right Yeah, there we go. So we'll just tighten up the other one. That's it. Fantastic. So I just need to cut a piece of this to the right size. Yeah, there we go. So I'll stick that on. Yeah, so this is the sticky bit. So I'm going to do it here so that the way it can go around that way. I'll report back when I've stuck it down. Yep, there we go. That's not going anywhere. So the ground is the right hand side. I'll show you in a minute. There's four pins here. Just to connect this up, I'm going to pull off the uh, ATX. Uh, connector here, you know the XX power thing. And we're filming from the back of the Falcon here, so you can see the connector. The right hand pin is the ground, and the one next to it is the 12 volts. So this connector I'm using is like a really small JST. It's perhaps technically not the right type of connector here, but you'll see it goes on, and it goes on really firmly, like that. So that is, uh, that's it, job done. So I just need to just, uh, I don't know, root this wire perhaps down there, like that. So it's, uh, it's not going anywhere, is it? And we can carefully reconnect up the power supply. Just hold the bot with the board while I clip that on. That's it. I don't like the way these uh, wires are here. You could do with a, a strain relief or something inside the case, because, yeah, you could, I don't know, you could cause some damage there. Switch it on. Hey, there we go. And I can feel it's pulling air in towards the fan. And we've got airflow. Wow, good airflow out the sides of the blades there. Yeah, there's lots, lots of airflow coming out the sides here of these the, of the vents on the fan. Uh, and because it's in profile with the memory here, I think it should just about fit inside the case. Now a few people kindly pointed out that the version of the code I've installed, you know, these uh, control panel things and stuff here, might not work properly with the 60E here, uh, of the CT60E. So if we click on temperature, you'll see the temperature is very low at the moment, but I know that that is working correctly. A few people have said that doesn't report the temperature correctly on the CT60E, but from my experience testing I found it does. Uh, so whilst it's showing a really low temperature there now, that's because that fan's on. 
normally by the time this has uh, just been on a few minutes that would have been up to I don't know 46 47 degrees normally so it's like a clear five degrees less already and when I clocked this at 90 and I'll show you that now if we just do uh, control panel on, and we go down to the bottom CT60 config change from temperature to memory Strangely, it's in the memory settings, but you can see it just about. It says 66.6 .6 megahertz. So if I just click this here, and we go all the way across to 90. This does run at 90, and Quake runs really well. You can go past 90. Good God. Okay, let's just go back down to 90. I don't want to go beyond 90 at this stage. I think we'll do the fine adjust. might just try it afterwards to see if it can go beyond, not much beyond 90. Apparently some of these can go to 105 megahertz, which is crazy. And if we just click OK, that is now running at 90. Um, we may be able to see a change in temperature, I'm not sure. Might need to reboot it, I'm not sure if it changes instantly. Let's try a reset. Yeah, after a reset you can see up there it says 90 megahertz. And so the next thing we're going to do is load Quake. The other thing that someone's told me is you need to run NVDI uh, because otherwise it can be super flaky. Now I've found that Gembench crashes, I'll show you that in a minute. So it'll be interesting to see A if it crashes again, if it does then I'll install NVDI and we'll see if that solves that problem. I'm hoping it does. And let's just see how that runs. I think you'd be surprised at how well this runs on here. And we'll check the temperature again after this has been running the demo for a minute or two. Look at the speed of that. That's crazy. I really need to get the uh, a proper video cable for this. I've got a SCART cable coming so it'd be interesting to see how much clearer it is on the TV because at the moment we use an RF. But yeah, that's nuts how fast that is. It's amazing. So it's been going for about uh, 10 minutes there. Let's just quit out. Yes. Yep. And we can go straight to the temperature thing. Have a look. Hang on, I can click it. Look at that, 46 degrees. It's only like a few degrees more than it was before. That is incredible. Now, as I say, people are going to pipe up and say, well, the temperature thing isn't accurate on this, on the CT60E. Um, you know, so it could be 5 degrees or 10 degrees higher than that. But it's, I'm all about the temperature change here. And pr prior to this, when I did this last night, without a fan or a heat sink, we're up to, like, I think, 57 degrees. So there's uh, a big difference with the fan there. You can see it's going down now, look. Now we're, on, uh, we're not going to load, it was 47 on it or something, or 46, it's now 45. And now at 95 megahertz, I don't know how far I dare push this. 95 megahertz, I, I might just try 100, but then I'll be dropping it back down. Again we'll check temperature. That's incredible. Incredible you can run these at 95. It's a 50 megahertz part, but then again, a lot of these Motorola chips, you did tend to be able to get 100% out of them, didn't you? A touch beyond 100%. The default, this is clocked at 66, so it's overclocked even at uh, you know a stock configuration, if you like. I don't leave that too long because that is quite uh, fast. But let's just see what the immediate temperature reported is. 47. Again, it's like 10 degrees less than it was when I was running, uh, you know, at uh, 90 last night without a fan and heat sink. It's kind of holding 47 now, which is to be expected because it's obviously running quite fast. Right, go on, let's try 100. Yep, 100 megahertz reported up top right there. So I'm running at 100 megahertz, it's fine. 
We aren't obviously going up much here. These increments, you know, we've just we originally tested at 90. We've only gone up to 100. It's only like a you know a 10% increase or something. So I'll come out of that and we'll check the temperature again. Yeah, 47. It's not changed, does it? It's not changed. But I feel really cool air coming outside to that fan, a lot of it. And as I was about to take this off here, it just suddenly struck me. All of these things that come out the back here, you know what would be really nice? If someone 3D printed something to fit there. Because those buttons, if you put those buttons next to each other, I think, well, you couldn't fit them onto a 3D mount thing, but you could in theory have a couple of buttons and a couple of LEDs on a little panel that if it was 3D printed, it could fit there. I'm thinking maybe something that's, you know, a piece of plastic that could fit on the other side, it's got a couple of clips so you could push it in here. Does that make sense? And then you could probably replace this whole cable here with something with really short wires to panel mount uh, similar things to this. You know, these aren't panel mount, but uh, yeah, it's just an idea. And that similarly, back here where the power wire goes, you could literally 3D print something with a hole wide enough for that and have a grommet and uh, have the power thing there, do you know what I mean? Put a little panel, clip it in, and just have the power lead coming out the back. And that would make it a really nice, tidy mod. So I might just uh, post some pictures to a few people I know who do 3D printing and see what their thoughts are. I don't want to stress someone out with a load of work here, but if someone's got an ST, the, the things are the same here, the switch cavity and that cavity there. Uh, if they've got an ST, they'll be able to do it themselves because they've got the same base unit if you see what I mean it's the same plastic anyway let's get this out we'll clean that to dim up in a minute I think it's a dim it's a bit thick for a sim and I will just clean the top of this with uh, cotton buds and IPA you can see we've got the odd little bit of dirt here so I'll just inspect it uh, and see where it could do with a clean Yeah, look, there was just a bit of dirt there. It came off, look, it's a little bit bluey green. Can you see that? Kind of a bluey mark. So there was a little bit of corrosion just sort of started, uh, landed on there. You can't really corrode gold like that. Gold is like really hardy when it comes to uh, res uh, corrosion. It's a soft metal, so you can wear it off pretty easy, but uh, it won't uh, rust, not under normal atmosphere and stuff anyway. Yeah, that should do. It's pretty clean, that, to be fair. So having cleaned that up, we should need to get that back in. And if memory serves, these ones, these dims, have we got this the right way around, first of all? I think I have. Yeah. You push them down, don't you, and then the clips come up, I think, at the sides. Yeah, there we go. And just for good measure, just press them in. Uh, and I left these messily at the start here. We just got a fudge wire here, and we fitted a 22 ohm here. Because I only had 22s, and it should be 33. So anyway, let's just get a large blob of solder and slide that 22 ohm resistor off. Hopefully I won't lose the pads doing this. I should use hot air really. But as you can see, look, it's pretty easy. Simple stuff. There we go, it's off on the mat. And to easily get the new one on, we'll just use a bit of braid on one pad here. Like that. And then we can slide it up there and just melt that top point and I'll e equal the solder points off after we're done but the other thing I'm going to do is just remove this wire here and there's a bit of reasoning behind this you really don't want uh, like a, a long wire like that because this clock stuff is bodgy as anything as it is you know there are issues with the clock and what I'm going to do is just clean up that trace where it's been cut I don't know you can see it I'll perhaps put you on macro in a sec so you can see the cut but if I clean up the trace here and the wire and I'm just going to get a piece of coil wire over that trace where it's actually broken and uh, we'll just get a little bit of solder on there we can remove the excess as I say in a minute I really need to do this under magnification I can't see what I'm doing That looks pretty straight to me, I think. Just get a tiny bit of solder there. 
remove the solder from the tip and just to touch these. Yeah, yeah, that's not too bad. The solder is probably a little bit too blobby, but anyway. So I can't show you the next bits as like this. I need to be on uh, mag using magnification. As I say, the, the trace here is broken. I'm going to scratch a little bit of the trace off on the other side to make sure there is enough to solder onto, and then I'll just put some coil wire, solder it, and then I'll show you the result. So yeah, you can see the solder blobs on that left-hand resistor there, a bit big. You can see the scratch on the PCB. Can you see over the top of the wire I have added uh, and then the replacement resistor so it's not say uh, 1206 is it they're slightly smaller the one down there looks slightly smaller as well look um, but anyway it fits it's perhaps more aligned with the top than the bottom the one I've added on the right um, but that trace is now fixed so the other thing I'm doing is making a switch up switch between uh, 60 you know, the 060 and the 030 Falcon, the normal Falcon mode. So I've got a little uh, thing here, two pin connector. It still needs filing down a bit, you can see it's not that even. But it should do the job, so we'll just uh, shrink these two wires on here with a bit of heat shrink. So there's my short little switch. You can see I've isolated everything here with heat shrink, including the uh, metal part of the stick there. So that should just plug onto that switch and I, I couldn't leave, leave it internally to be able to switch between the Falcon uh, 030 and 060 or I could have it external because it, uh, it will just reach out the back there. Anyway let's just uh, clean those marks off there. Yeah we've got a bent pin there, can you see that? Let's, uh, just, let's just take this dim out again. Grab that one pin. Bend it back up that way a little bit. Yeah, that's not too bad now. It's back in position. And there we go. And our switch, as I say, is just out the back here. So let's switch it on. I think that should be in Falcon 030. I keep saying Falcon when I mean 030. Look, yeah, that is 030. Switch it off. Switch my little switch over. And that should be back in 060. Fantastic. Just makes it super easy now to switch between 030 and 060. So I changed that resistor back to 22 ohms for the moment. I seem to have inadvertently discovered one way to gain a bit of stability, certainly when using the CT60, because I only had the 22 at the start, we fitted that, and this gain was rock solid, as was the system. As soon as I changed it to 33, to put it back in line with its original spec, I start getting lots of problems. Quake, you couldn't run it for more than a minute. It would start the first scene of the demo, and then just as it got towards the end of that, it's about to the next bit, it would just freeze. And uh, it was repeatable, um, time after time. So, yeah, I thought, well, okay, let's try changing that resistor back to 33 ohms, uh, sorry, 22 ohms, which is exactly what I've just done. And it's just been rock solid. It's just been absolutely rock solid. You can see it's loading the next scene. Previously, it would have frozen before that. Um, it's gone round a few times here now without an issue, but I couldn't get that stability with the original 33 ohm resistor. Anyway, I'm waiting for the uh, that clock mod to come from Iju Arana, so hopefully that should uh, do the same sort of thing. These have arrived. I've got a low profile socket here for the replacements and the RAM chip. So if I just uh, take this out of here, should be wearing a wrist strap really. So you can see it's got a little uh, battery. I'm surprised it doesn't come with a battery. That has really annoyed me actually. Um, yeah, so I need to go find a battery. So that holds the uh, NV uh, RAM settings, but also the uh, time and date. You can see it's got a nice little uh, Pac Man thing on the uh, silk screen there, that's quite cool. And it's nice and tidy, that, I like that. So this came from Exos, the Exos store. I'll post some links down below to this. Copyright 2018. You can see it's just literally that chip on the underside, the battery holder, and the crystal. The other thing we'll do is we'll take that chip off. I'm going to try and dremel into it just to see if we can replace the battery that's on the existing chip on board. Anyway, I need to go see if I can find a cell for this. Yes, yeah, so let me show you what this is doing. 
the desolder station is warming up. This has not been powered on for a few days, but generally, if you leave it off for maybe five minutes, it will lose the uh, NVRAM settings, as you'll see. Got an exception there. That's probably to do with the timing thing. I'll just reset. I've also got some uh, more RAM coming for this. It's got 256 meg at the moment, but it will accommodate a 512 meg DIM. Can you see that NVRAM read error? I and mean, then you've got the option to uh, in it. Anyway, I'm not going to do that. If you click that, it's okay generally. You might have to then reset again, but whilst it's powered on, that will then sort it. So in my case, it's just the battery. But as I say, you could have instances where the chip itself has died, the RAM is bad in it, etc. So I've got the board on the ESD mat here now, and this desolder station is heated up. I've got this just around the 400 degrees mark. It might be a bit uh, too hot, it might be a bit too cool on the, the ground connection. So let's just, uh, hang on, add a little bit of solder. There we go, that's coming off. Yeah, so there are a few uh, pins missing, as I say, you know, that are not fitted on these chips. Gaps in the profile. So we'll just uh, grab a few of the pins here and have a little bit of a pivot. I'm hoping this will come off without any issue. I really don't want to damage it. Let's just see if that's uh, loose. Mm. Doesn't really feel as loose as it could be. You can see, can you see that? It's coming up, look, and it's off there, look. No damage by the looks of things. So using the Anesty there, it's a Duratool clone, it was dead easy, no problem. So I need to unblock the, the where there weren't pins. There's like four, five, six, I think six pins there. So I'll unblock those and then we'll get the socket on. So we'll have a quick clean under here before we fit our new socket. Be careful because one or two bits of solder there are sharp, you know. Because I haven't used any braid or anything like that on this side. We've just pulled it off from the underside. But we may as well clean up while we can here now because we're obviously not going to have an opportunity once the socket goes on. So the socket again came from uh, Exos's web store. It's a low profile one. Can you see how low down that is? That's about half as high as the, these things normally are. So pin one is up here. Uh, hopefully the holes are unblocked enough. Yeah, we might have the odd one there that just needs a little bit more work from the other side. Now that's on. That's on, I'll just uh, flip it over, make sure it's uh, flat and flush. Yeah, that's nice and flat. So let's just uh, solder a couple of diagonal opposite points. And then I'll inspect it, and we'll I'll solder the remaining points. Yeah, so you can see our socket is nice and flat and level. Yeah, that's fine, so let's just solder the remaining points on here. And of course the nice thing with having a socket like this, it's uh, kind of uh, future proof it, doesn't it? If this chip ever needs to come off, it's not a problem, it's just in a socket. Very easy for someone to swap. So I'm just going to uh, position a piece of paper towel here and kind of hold and press that down. Because what I don't want is this flicking and going all over the back end of the board here. I just want to just focus on this little bit. There we go, super clean and tidy. So let's remove the uh, ESD sponge from this. Pin one marking is here, which goes the same way uh, on the PCB. Carefully try and push that in. Is that gonna go in? Why is that not going in? Oh, that's an incredibly tight fit. It just had to press a fair bit and then it went snap, it just went straight in. So it looks so it looks okay. I don't think we've got any broken or bent pins in terms of you know how that went in. But it was very stiff. Anyway, we need a battery. 
So we've got it all connected up again, let's uh, switch it on. Yeah, that's a good sign, I haven't completely killed it. Now it's going to do the same thing again, I think, it's going to say NVRAM. Uh, you know, in it, it needs initialising or something along those lines, let's skip the memory test. It's interesting, that's got like a 90 odd second uh, thing there. Yeah, there we go. In it. And then I think if we uh, power cycle it or reset it. Bear in mind I haven't got a battery at the moment so I can't do a proper power cycle. Second time round it should be okay. Assuming that RAM is okay. Yeah, sweet. No errors. So that is a success I think. So whilst this has been running really well, and I had this running at 100 megahertz earlier, uh, there are some instabilities. Uh, I'll give you an example. This demo in the CT60, uh, 60, you know, 60, 060 mode, it always fails, and it's almost at the same point every time. So I'm going to leave this recording. I'll perhaps skip to the point where it bombs in a minute. But I just wanted to capture this before I do a mod. Uh, now there's a mod outlined on the uh, CT60 website, you know, the original website for the original version before it became a CT60E. Uh, and it suggests adding a uh, termination resistor onto, I think it's the clock that goes to the DMA chip. It's the S, is it SDMA? I think it is. So it controls like SCSI and sound DMA. And it's kind of like right on the right hand side of the board. And this ties into the clock problems that I may have mentioned previously. You know, the clock gets split three ways via some resistors. This bit always works. It's when the scene changes in a minute, you get, uh, you know, the whole background image is different and then it changes through, here it is. Four different scenes working on, this first one. There you go, got a crash. It's consistent, it happens either on the first one, the second one, the third one or the fourth one. When I say the four there, I'm talking about you just get this text you know the text changes and then it changes and then it changes and each time I think it's hitting the disc the other thing, we'll just reset this, the other thing I noticed in terms of instability here besides not being able to play that demo at all beyond that point you've just seen is Quake um, and this issue is more common when it's warm like it is today I've seen this sort of problem before on the various things we've looked at in the past it's an impedance thing, you know, uh, the ambient temperature affects uh, high frequency stuff when you've got issues like this so hang on a sec yeah I'm not explaining that very well if you think back to the issue uh, where I uh, you know resolved the sound issues on the MVS multi cars you know that 161 and 1 stuff the sound glitch in there found exactly the same thing as soon as you got warm weather it glitched more than when it was quite cool um, and it's to do with humidity and stuff as well the way I understand it, I'll post a link down below to a really good website uh, which outlines the problems with the clocks on the Falcon. But ultimately, because the clock signals just go through a resistor, there's nothing to stop the chip that that clock signal goes to backfeeding and affecting other things that are feeding from that clock. Does that make sense? Uh, and of course, it's about the length of the trace, the, the trace that goes all the way from where the clock signal is produced to the SDMA, I think that's hung already, yeah it has, to the SDMA, it's quite a long trace and that's going to pick up noise along the way and the length of it ultimately is, is going to be part of the problem as well. So I think the solution is to add, as I say, a termination resistor, let's just reset that, I'll try it again, add a termination resistor which should help with reflection. So I think, I think that's what, how that's going to work, it's, it's, it is a termination resistor it's the same sort of thing if you think about dealing with reflection on video cables and you have termination resistors at either end that is to stop reflection that's my understanding it's where the signal kind of bounces back at the other end and reflects back the other way um, in uh, layman's terms I think correct me if I'm uh, wrong below so we'll try it again so here we go second time around it's hitting the hard disk hitting the hard disk hitting the hard disk I think it's working this time hitting the hard disk that should start now hopefully unless it failed on that last read and I think it did 
this is the thing, it's like it's loaded. So this was a clue to me, yeah, okay, maybe it is to do with this clock. I can't even load it in this warm weather. So this mod, hopefully it should still work with the uh, you know, 030 mode. What we need to do is, I've just cut a resistor to size, which needs to get a little bit of solder onto this leg here. This is ground, I've just uh, tested that. And I've scratched, Can you, you might not be able to see, I'll put you on macro when I've done it. Scratch the second trace that goes to this chip here from the top side here, second one down. Um, this is all on the uh, website here for the CT60. And we need to join a ground here. So let's just heat that. There we go, that's that side joined. And you can't really see this, but I need to trim this off so that it's just the right length to overlap there a little bit. Like that. Remove my leg. Well, not my leg, that leg. And then I need to heat, I'm just bend it down a little bit actually, I think, towards the trace. As I say, I'll show you this on macro in a minute. And I need to heat that trace and add a little bit of solder. So that's our resistor soldered on. I'm just going to measure from there carefully to the second pin on here. Yeah, we've got continuity. First pin's all right, second pin, we've got a joint. So bear in mind, when you solder into very, very fine traces like that, any movement on this, we will break that trace, rip it off. I did have a look to see if I had any SMD resistors because I would have preferred to, you know, scratch it off just like it did and then stick an SMD 47 ohm resistor and then use a little bit of wire from the other end of the resistor to here. And I would use a very fine wire like Kynar or something. So anyway, that's uh, okay. I will test that in a second. But now we've added that uh, resistor there on the SDMA, I think we'll just put this back to 33 ohms again. So yeah, we've gone around in circles a little bit. Changing that resistor there, it's been off and on, off and on. And we've got all three 33 ohm resistors in place. So with the original standoffs here for this drive, they were making the drive too high up here. So when you put the lid on, you couldn't get the screws on this side, you know, you couldn't get the lid to close properly on this side. It needed to be completely flat. And you can see that better here, you see these little plastic standoffs? The drive is now sat on top of those. And the way I have done that is to replace these plastic spacers here and that one. Incidentally, that one wouldn't go into the, the hole. It was sat on the side of the drive because the drive uh, screw holes, I think, are not correctly drilled. I used some of these. So you can see how much shorter those are there. Uh, and it's got a hole for a screw, and I had four screws, brand new ones, just the right uh, length to go through the underneath of the ST into that. And then these sides here have just screwed into the underneath of the GoTech. So that means now, as I said, that the drive fits completely flat and flush. But what I think I'll do is I'll stick these into a plastic, a small plastic bag and tape it somewhere on the inside of the machine so it's, it's not going to get lost. I'll secure it so that, you know, they're not going to rattle around in there or anything. And they will be inside a little ESD bag of some sort. But if I just uh, hinge this uh, over there like that, settle it down, look, it's, it's flat now. Show you. So you can see this seam here. This is all flat and flush. That wasn't happening before because that drive was pushed too far upwards. So a battery arrived. I've fitted that on the real-time clock chip there. I'm filming this bit right at the very end here just to show you that the real-time clock is working. That is the date where I'm actually editing this particular part of the video. So you can see it's uh, quarter past five. I've actually been editing this since about lunchtime. It's crazy how long they take to edit. Some of the things that got caught footage-wise, when I installed the CT60E, once it first booted, you saw an exception there. That was related to NVDI, uh, or rather the blitzer. The blitzer is the problem. Um, with the CT60, because the blitzer is only, I think, 24-bit, it can't operate with RAM in the 32-bit address range, you know, i.e. the uh, TT RAM. The net result, I think, is that you get problems it's unstable totally unstable when you use the blitzer so the way you get around that is to install nvdi so if you're lucky enough to get a falcon and you're lucky enough to get a ct60 
then install NVDI is one of the very first things you do. But I also installed some of the control panel stuff for these things here. This is where this temperature thing came from. It's not there as default. You actually have to install, I'll show you, on the C drive. You have a folder where you put all your CPX files. Um, this was already set up, this compact flash card, so it had lots in there. But it, but it didn't have the CT60 stuff, so you can see I added uh, a few. There's a few. There's that one there, CT60 Conf and this uh, General 60 or something, I think, somewhere in there. There it is, General 6. Um, and that gives you, you know, the plugins there in the control panel. Um, there's two different ways of viewing the control panel here. I'm not quite sure whether that's standard or not. You can see the CT60 stuff there. And because I installed NVDI, you can see you've got some options there as well. But after having done that, that exception you saw right at the very, very start of this video here, I haven't had one like that not one at all uh, and can use that switch to switch back into 030 and again it's absolutely rock solid but with the resistor you know a termination resistor added to the sdma chip it's absolutely rock solid i can run this at 100 megahertz for an hour and it's solid and if i check the temperature it's like a good 10 degrees you know cooler than it was without the fan but i wouldn't run it at 100 for any period of time generally I've uh, stuck this at 70 and that's what I've been using it at for the last three or four weeks. So I'll do some direct captures of some of these demos. I've already uploaded two of them already that's on the shared on Discord. Um, but I will upload this one and some more later with direct capture. Now if you remember earlier along, when the scene changes in a minute and you get four different lots of text here, this is where it was freezing. So yeah, absolutely rock solid. The other interesting thing, I did some testing off camera in 030 mode when I started hitting that problem. And I did get the same problems just using the standard 030. So, you know, that's part of the original clock problem that, the, that, that went with the Falcon. Um, so I'm not sure who originally worked that out. I think it might be, was it Rudolph, the person who originally worked on the CT60? That termination resistor, for me, seems to just completely solve it for both the 030 and the 060. Other things you can do with the CT60, you can cache the ROM in RAM. A bit like people do on the Amiga. So let's, uh, let's try and start that. The thing that's immediately noticeable is it's way faster at loading. The 060, perhaps because it's using PIO for the IDE, is way quicker. And look at the frame rate, I think you can tell the difference straight away. So that shows the bottleneck when we looked on the 030 version, when we played it on this on the 030. The bottleneck was not the graphics side of things, the bottleneck was just about CPU power. Because that is way better way better and as you can see I've got it um, maximized you know you've got some bars at the top that show you how much uh, health and armor and stuff and perhaps ammo and stuff you've got but that is just so much better I can't believe it it's ultimate doing this so sound effects are slightly in, uh, enhanced there And this version has got free look. You can see you can aim upwards and stuff look. It's quite cool. Yeah, you'd be hard pressed to uh, tell what was running on a Falcon. You may think it's on a 486DX266 or something. And press the door then. Sweet. Some other things to quickly mention here. You can see in the CT60 control panel uh, thing here, 
you've got a threshold thing for the temperature setting. So I think that there are two connections on that CT60 board that provide a PWM fan signal. So if you've got like a three pin fan, you can connect that up and you can set a threshold here and you can say when it gets to 50, you know, kick the fan in. I think that's what this is for. But my personal approach with all these things generally is to always have a fan running. I, I, I get more annoyed by hearing a fan starting and stopping than having a continuous fan running in the background. And of course, it's gonna mean you're always running cooler if the fan is running all the time. And the other thing to point out here, this is related to the NV RAM. You can see these boot options here, and this is stuff that's typically stored in the NV RAM, I think. Well, some of it is. Uh, there's the option there to put the toss into RAM. That speeds up the system even further. It's interesting that the blitter option is there, but the blitter causes problems. You do need NVDI installed, as I mentioned earlier. And then you've also got video boot settings here. And this is stuff that's stored in the NV RAM. And you can you see an option down here that says replace NV RAM. If you tick that, look, you can either you know highlight it or unhighlight it. When that's highlighted, when the system boots, it will copy these settings to the NV RAM. So if you've got a battery problem, like we had with this board, and it's very common in the Falcon for those, uh, you know, the real-time clock chip battery there to fail, this this is like a workaround. Saves you having to replace that chip. But it's always a good idea to replace that chip, in my mind. Because typically, when batteries fail on devices like that, the, you can get into a scenario where you get a latch up. It's, it's quite uh, rare, but it does happen. It's a bit like MVS boards, you know, arcade boards, where the backup RAM, you know, the battery goes on that, people don't replace it, eventually the backup RAM dies. So, yeah, it's always a good idea to replace that chip, but this is a nice way around, temporarily to avoid having to force you to replace it. Uh, and these settings, like I say, you configure these in the MV uh, RAM. I can show you actually, there's a utility I have on my D drive here, if I just scroll down. Yeah, there it is, a boot conf. I forget where I got this from, it was just somewhere on the net. Uh, and you can see the same things here, you change the color, uh, the columns, uh, whether it's PAL or NTSC your video output mode, whether you want interlaced on, etc. And you click OK and it saves that to the that chip there, the real-time clock chip. Um, and it's the same with, the, you know, you can set the date and time and stuff in here as well. So we've had to bring the video to a close again there. It's a little bit shorter than the first part, and I appreciate I've not really shown you very many games or demos or anything in this video. It was just going on a little bit too long, but I also needed to make sure there's enough content for the next part, because unfortunately it has leaked into a third part. We still need to do some stuff on the next video. I haven't connected this up to a VGA monitor yet, which is totally possible. And whilst you've seen it running on the TV with crystal clear display here, I had to do some stuff to, you know, with the cable and the adapter to make that work. So that's covered in the next part as well. The other thing that's in the next part is this has an internal speaker or should have an internal speaker. Normally the shielding that would be in here, and this hasn't got the shielding because some of it are the CT60, and if you've got CT60 you can't have the shielding. Well the shielding supports the speaker, the internal speaker, so you get internal sound, a bit like you get on the Archimedes. So I want to do something with that. I also want to increase the RAM, you know that's uh, 256 meg DIM, stick a 512 meg DIM, and one or two other things, and I can show you some of the demos and games and things, including Duke Nukem 3D. But at the same time this video goes up, I'll post some links in the description. They won't be publicly visible on my channel, but there'll be links in the description to see a couple of demos. And the quick demo of Quake running as well, you know, and the direct captures. If you want to watch those, the links for those will be down below. So special thanks to William. I absolutely love this machine. It's fantastic. As I said in the last video, it's the prize of my collection, this machine now. Uh, and it's come out really well. The case was put into the sun a little bit. Um, and it's not as faded here. You can still see these little white marks, hardly anything here. It was very visible there before. But after just about an hour in the sun, it looks fantastic. There's hardly anything. There's just, like I said, this white edge here and a little bit there. I hope you can uh, see from the camera how much better that is from the previous video. So if we get any more sun, I'll stick it out in the sun a little bit longer as well. But the badge looks fantastic now. We've got the CT60 up and running and it's rock solid stable. Thank you to Exos for providing the uh, NV RAM chip. Obviously I paid for it, but thanks for sending that. It was really nice and uh, it didn't suffer from the fluxy connections that those RAM boards uh, suffered in the first video. So I was pleasantly surprised to see it looking super clean and tidy. So thanks again, William. 
Uh, if you'd like to support the channel, please see the Patreon and coffee links down below. Thank you very much to all my subscribers, my patrons, anyone that comments, and uh, I'll catch you in the next video.